Hello everyone, welcome to our webinar. My name is Andrew Townsend, I'm with eLearning Brothers. Today's session is about uh, using variables in Lectora. This session will be recorded, we'll get a copy of it emailed out to everybody who has registered to uh, watch this after the fact. If you have questions during the webinar, we'll be ready to take your questions and you can also participate in, and uh, give responses inside the questions panel. It looks like some of you have already found that, so please do use that. It's in the GoToWebinar control panel there on the side of your screen. Um, all right, so to talk to us about Lectora, we have Andrew Vass, one of our expert developers with us today. Thanks, Andrew, for your time. And without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn the time over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, everyone, for joining me today. Super excited to talk to you guys about Lectora, specifically variables in Lectora. Uh, Lectora is one of my favorite authoring tools to talk about. I, I love what it can do. And <clears throat> so let's jump right into this. So variables are... Variables are really what turn a static, boring slideshow into a dynamic, smart e-learning course. And they're, they're really important in all computer programming, whether you're creating e-learning, or if you're actually coding, or whether you're a graphic designer. You'll be using some form of variables in, uh, in, in your development and your design process. So today what we're going to cover is specifically when talking about variables in Lectora is I'll go over what a variable is, how that's defined in Lectora, the different types of variables, how you can use the variable manager. I'll go over the uh, what's a three-step process for using variables, creating, assigning, and referencing them. And then hope if we have time at the end, I'll jump into actually some practical use cases for how you can use the things I'm talking about and put them into a put them into a course. All right, so what's a variable? It's kind of hard to describe what a variable is, especially when it comes to e-learning and Lectora, but some popular analogies that are out there are a variable is like a container, or like, like a container, a bucket, or a brain. And what that means is that a variable is just a a place where you can store information and where you and that you can grab from later as you're developing your course. And when you store information, there's a lot of things you can do with it. And like I mentioned before, working with variables is kind of a, th a three-step process. And if you've gone through some training before, some variable training before, before you've probably seen a variation of this. But the first step in using variables is to create. You have to create create the container to put the information in. And once you create that container or that bucket, then you have to actually put something in there. You have to assign it because it's pointless if you have a, a bucket or a container and you're not putting anything in putting anything in there. Then it's kind of useless. So once you put the information in there, the next the final step in this variable in this variable process is using that variable. And again, like it's pointless to create a bucket and not put anything in there. It's pointless to put something in a bucket if you're not going to use it later. Otherwise, you would just end up getting rid of the information or the objects in the bucket and throwing them away. Now, this in this use part is really where the the real functionality of variables comes into play. That the value of variables doesn't come with the information you can gather. It's what you're using with the information that you gather. And variables really are the it's a simple Simple concept to understand, but it is the most powerful tool you'll use in all of your e-learning development besides um, right before getting into coding. And, but using variables does not require any sort of knowledge of any, any coding language. That's all, that all happens directly in the authoring tool for you, and, and that's why they're so powerful, because it makes you be able to do some things that otherwise you would have to use coding language to get done and they really allow you to create intricate, complex courses that respond to the learner input, which is really what we're all about when creating e-learning. So let's jump into Lectora, get out of here, and talk about the different types of variables. And oh, I forgot to mention before, I am using Lectora 18, specifically version 18.0.2. If you're using pretty much any other version of Lectora, the process I'm talking about will be will be exactly the same. So you won't have to worry about mixed messaging there. But just so you're aware, we're in version 18, which is the most current version. 
All right, so I have a blank project here. And in order to get started creating a variable, I come up to the Tools panel, Tools window at the top, and select Variables. And what this does is it opens what's called the Variable Manager, which allows me to see all the variables in my course and allows me to create any variables that I would need as well. <clears throat> now, there are two types of variables in Lectora, user-defined and reserved. User-defined is pretty self-explanatory. These variables are created by the by you, by the developer, for uh, to use for a purpose somewhere in your course, later in the course. The variables are what they call global, which means that they can be used and recalled at any time in your project. And what user-defined variables are, they can be used for several different reasons. Maybe you're creating a uh, trying to manipulate course progress, you want to create some branching functionality, or if you're performing certain calculations in your course, or moving and resizing objects, or creating game elements and badging. That can all be done by implementing some user-defined variables and then using them in, in unique ways, which, which we will get into. And to create a variable, all I have to do is open up this variable manager and click Add. And, it will, and this will allow me to specify a name for a variable. A variable name can be anything you want as long as it doesn't contain spaces. Uh, good practice is to avoid, when you're creating a, um, a variable, avoid using the names of anything else that's in Lectora. So avoid having your variables be named the same as maybe a, a shape that you have in the course or an image that you have in the course. It's not if you have a variable that's named exactly the same as another, another element in your course, most likely it's not going to break. But as I've, in the years that I've, that I've been developing, I have noticed that there have been a few times where I've had super complex interactions and I have a variable that's associated with an, an action and an image and a shape and a button, and they're all named the same. And it can cause some things to break and can also cause some confusion when you are developing. So a good, pra good practice is to just have a standard naming convention for everything. Always start with a, with a letter when you're creating a variable. And again, no, no spaces. It won't even allow you to use spaces anyway, so, so no worries there. After you set your variable name, you can set the initial value. And this is what is going to be to be in the bucket by default when you create the variable. By default, Lector will set that as a value of zero. I can have that stay as zero, I can have it be any other number I want, I can have it be empty, or I can even have it be a combination of letters, numbers, or words. Whatever I want, I can put as this initial value. But I, I like to keep those blank because you're I'm always going to, with a user-defined variable, you'll always end up probably setting it somewhere anyway manually. So I always just keep my, uh, my default, my user-defined variables blank. A couple options you have when creating variables, you can retain the variable value between sessions. And what that means is if you have this checked, the learner is going through the course and they've done some sort of action to assign this variable, so to put something in that bucket. If they exit the course at any time, once they return, if it's a SCORM published course, then that value will, um, will still be assigned. It won't reset. If you do not have this selected, then once the learner exits the course, that's going to clear out the bucket and well not clear it out, but set it back to this initial value, whatever you've whatever you've assigned there. You can also have you also have the option to randomize the initial value. Never have never had to use that functionality before, but it's there if you need it. And what's also super helpful about this variable manager is that you have a variable use window right here. So you can see everywhere in your course that that variable is used. So for example, if you have to make changes to a variable and you don't want to, to break anything in your course, you can come in here, look at all the places that variable is used and make sure that you have taken all of those spots into account when making some updates. That's all it takes to create a user a user defined variable. So I'll just click OK, and now that variable is set and ready for me to to put some information in anywhere in my course that I would need to. The other variables that Lector has are are reserved variables, and what these are these are variables that are created by Lectora, 
And <clears throat> these include default things such as current chapter name, current date, the, the browser type, all of these will have good descriptions of what they are. And these are reserved because as a, while you're editing or creating your course, these variables right here, you cannot change the, uh, cannot set the value of these. So these are automatically set based on, for example, what browser the user is viewing the course in, that will set the value here and you don't have any, any option to actually manually change that to a specific value you would want. And that's the same with all of these right here. However, that's not the case with all reserved variables, because for example, if you wanted to add a form element to your course, like a, like a radio button or a fill in the blank box, a text entry field or some sort of quiz question, those variables will come in. Every time you create a quiz question or a form element, it creates a variable. So it creates a bucket that's associated with that specific element. Those are reserved variables in Lectora. However, you do have access to edit and modify those values as you would need to. I'll get, I'll get more into that in a bit as we go through exactly how to edit variables. But I do want to show you something really quick. So these are all the default reserved variables Lectora will have for you. And you can call these using variable references at any point in your course. I'll also get into that in a bit. However, if you have your course set to publish to SCORM or AICC, and that's done up here in the design tab in the title options. Right now it's just a standard title which will publish to HTML. But if I have that selected, click OK. If I come back up to the variable manager, now in my reserved variables section I have a lot more variable variables that I can that I can call and use in my course. Some of these are editable, so you can actually change the value using actions if you would like. Some of them are just um, containers that you can that you can reference and that will show up in an LMS environment. It can get pretty deep, so I won't get into all of that as far as what what each of these mean and which ones are editable and which ones aren't. However, just keep in mind that when you are creating a SCORM compliant course or a Tin Can XAPI compliant course in Lectora, there will be some extra variables in there for you to use. And there's Lectora has a lot of great documentation about that. It goes into each of these variables on their um, on Trivanus's website, so you can check that out. Any questions so far, Andrew? Awesome. Okay, so moving along, I'm going to re-enable the standard project so I get rid of those unnecessary variables there. Now I'm going to get into how you can assign a, a variable, how you can assign a user-defined and a few system, or sorry, a few reserved variables as well. So as I mentioned, user-defined variables can be changed to whatever you want them to be, can be assigned, as I should probably use is a better word, to whatever you want them to be to create some some, interact, some interactivity and some logic in your course. And this is done by using a modify variable action. So if I come up to insert action, that will add an action to my, to my title. And up here in the actions window, under the action and target, I have some variable actions right here. In, in order to change a user defined variable, I would select a modify variable right there. And now I can, I can choose what I want to go into that bucket. So right now I only have one user defined variable, this variable one, so we'll stick with that. And there are three different things you can edit here. You can edit the target, so which is the, uh, the bucket that you're going to put something into. The type, so what action is actually going to modify that bucket, that container. And then the value, so what's actually going to go in there. Now, let's go over these options really quick. So if you're for set equal to, what this will do is it will ignore what's currently in the bucket. So that default value or the initial value that I showed you in the variable manager. If you have an action to set something, to set this variable equal to whatever the value is, that's going to clear what's already in that container and replace it with whatever I define here. And that can be a number, that can be uh, 
a string of letters, a word, a string of words, uh, several paragraphs even. Whatever I put in the value, it will just clear out that bucket and put in <clears throat> what I want it to say in there. Another option is set is empty. And what this will do is it'll just clear the bucket and set it to null. So it won't set it to zero because zero is a, numer a numerical value, which is actually something in the bucket. It will just set it to null, which means nothing is in that bucket. Now these next few, add to variable and subtract from variable, these actions will change depending on whether you have a number or a um, or text in your in your bucket. So let's say, for example, I have the number two in my bucket. Whether I've I have an action that set that that put that number two in there, or I had that number two in there by default, and I want to add to variable the number two. Now, when this action is fired, it will change from two. The value in the bucket will change from two to four because it's adding a number onto a number. However, if I have a number two in my bucket and I want to add a letter A, now the value in my bucket is going to be 2A because you can't add, using mathematical calculation, a letter onto a number. So it's just going to concatenate, which means it's just going to add to a string of values and it will keep building. The same thing, the same would go if I had a, a letter or a, a word in the bucket by default and I wanted to add another letter, it would just add that on there. Same with subtract, same with subtract. If I have a number and I want to subtract another number, it will perform that calculation. If I have a, a letter and I want to subtract another letter, it will just take that letter out of the bucket. Multiply and divide, so these next four, multiply, divide, round, and round down will all only apply to, num to numbers. So if you have a, um, a value that has a letter somewhere in your bucket, using these actions actually will not do anything. So multiply, divide, it's pretty straightforward. It'll just perform those mathematical calculations <clears throat> with the numbers that you set. And the round variable will round your number to the nearest whole number depending on what you have in there. So if I have, let's say, a, a value 1.4 in my bucket and I have an action that is going to round that variable, then the 1.4 is going to go down to 1. But if I have a 1.5, between 1.5 or 1.9 in my bucket and I use this action, then that will change the value in the bucket to 2. So just basic... Uh, rounding logic, I guess you could call it. <clears throat> Pretty straightforward. So if it's a uh, 0.4 or below, it'll round it down. 0.5 or above, it will round it up. This round down variable will automatically round down to the nearest whole number no matter what you have in the bucket. So if I have 2.9985, this round down action will round it down, will round it down to two. And again, all these last four Types here or actions here will only apply to numbers. They will not apply to letters if you have letters in your bucket. All right. So <clears throat> as I mentioned, we can create our own our own user-defined variables and modify them just like this, depending on uh, what you need to add in there. There's really no limit to what you can what you can put inside that bucket. At least I haven't found one as far as the amount of numbers or how high a number or the amount of text you can put in. You can really put in whatever you want there. And as I mentioned before, if you add a form element or a, a quizzing element to your course, so like a text or a text entry box, that will come with its own with its own variable. So let's say for example I want to add a a radio button group to my title. What that does is that adds three radio buttons there, and this is an interaction. So the learner can select this radio one, radio two, radio three. And what that does is that whatever value is selected in this radio button <clears throat> is going to change the value or what's in the bucket radio group underscore zero, 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 one. So there's just one bucket in this interaction is deciding what value goes into that variable. And I can change that value by using these, 
this this name right here. So this label field will change actually what shows up as the label of the radio button. This name field is actually going to change the value. So for example, when someone clicks radio one, if I want the bucket value to change to A, for example, I can select that. That label stayed the same. However, once I select that radio one, it's going to assign, it's not going to add, it's going to assign that uh, that bucket radio group underscore zero 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 one to that value a and that's all performed on the back end so that's pretty much just like Tora adding all of those actions that that I just showed you without you having to worry about any of that and if I come back to the variable manager you can see that that radio group variable was added to my reserved variables list because it is a variable that Lectora created. I didn't create it myself. However, if I come back here to my actions, I can actually call that in that action and do whatever I want to it. Assign any specific value that I would want into that bucket, <clears throat> even though it is a variable that was created by Lectora. So just keep that in mind. It can, it can get a little confusing as to what reserve variables you can edit and what you can't. But just so you can you kind of get the idea of the difference between user defined and reserved. And that sort of process, as far as like Tor creating a variable for you to use, will be the same for any form element. So for example, if I add a text entry field here, I can come up to the properties and see that the variable there is entry underscore zero 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 one. So anything that's typed into that entry field will will go into that entry underscore bucket right there. And what's nice about Lectora is I have the option to change the value of this variable to whatever I want, or sorry, the name of this variable to whatever I want, because it can get pretty confusing. For example, if I wanted to add another entry field here, now the variable for entry one is entry underscore zero 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 one, entry two, entry underscore zero 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 two. It can be hard to to remember what all of these values are if you have a bunch in your course and you're trying to <clears throat> call them later to add some sort of interactivity. So I can just come up here and call this name. We'll just call it name. And now. If I come back into my variable manager, it didn't add another variable. It just changed that name from entry two to name. <clears throat> so that's a, that's a really nice and useful hack. You have that with all, and again, it's kind of confusing because you can't change the name of all reserved variables, only reserved variables that are associated with um, form elements or quizzing elements. Let me show you what it looks like if you add a quiz question or just any sort of question. So let's say I had a multiple choice question right here. I have a variable name associated with this as well. And when you're adding a, a, a question element to your course, the variable is going to be the correct answer. So whatever I have set in this variable bucket, this question underscore 0001 bucket, Whatever value is in there, that is going to end up being the correct answer for this question. And again, I have the option to change that variable name as I would like. And, and other than that, it's pretty, it's almost exactly the same as using the, uh, the form fields that I just showed you. Let me pause there. Any questions yet? Oh, awesome. No, nope, pretty straightforward. Love that. Hopefully that means that it's all making sense. All right, moving along, let's look at conditions. So like I mentioned before, the reason that we collect information in these buckets is so we can use it later in our course to affect some sort of action, to add some, um, to add some logic to our course. And this is really how you turn a, a linear course, basically a slideshow, into something that is dynamic and reactive to, to the learner input. And we do this by what's called conditions, which is probably the biggest use for variables out there. And let's try this with a popular functionality. So let's say 
I have an interaction here. Just kind of, there's three buttons right here. And when the learner comes to this page, I want them to have to click all three of these buttons before they can move on in the course. So I'm going to add a next button right here as well. And this is a pretty basic functionality that a, uh, a lot of developers like to implement, but it's all based off variables and, and conditions. So I have these four buttons here that are my interaction and I have my next button. And I'm going to name these right here, just so I know what they are. We'll call this one button A. That one's on the bottom, button C, and button B. There we go. All right, now every time I insert a an interaction object, in this case a button, it will come with an action for me <clears throat> that I can modify up here. So I'll go to my next button and I'll add an action that says when the mouse is clicked, I want it to go to, to the next page. However, I don't want it to go to the next page until the learner has clicked every button on the screen. And I'll do that by using, uh, by using a variable, a user-defined var variable that I created. In this case, I will, I will use the, the variable one bucket that I created initially. To, to store some information and then to let to let my next button know when the when enough information has been gathered to where that door will open and the learner can move on in the course. To do that, I have to add some actions and then also add some what are called conditions. So I'll come up to button A, keep the trigger on mouse click, select the action, modify variable. I'm going to keep with my target variable one there. And then I don't want it to set equal to because I only want to use one bucket for this entire interaction, one variable. I don't want to have to create a bunch of different variables here. I can get away with using just one. So instead of set equal, I'm going to add to variable. And I'm going to use a text value instead of a number value right here. Because as I mentioned before, if I have a number value and I wanted to... <clears throat> To increase that number value, let's say I want my next button to say only advance the only advance the learner when variable one is greater than three, because in theory I have three buttons here. If variable one has to be greater than three to move on, technically the learner can just click one button three times, and then that will that will open that door and allow them to go forward. However, if I use a, a text variable, <clears throat> then I can make sure that that bucket contains values that are only dropped into the bucket when they're selecting these specific buttons. So that's why I said when this user clicks button A, add to variable A. And I'm actually just going to delete these actions and copy and paste to save myself some work here. I'll do the same thing on these other two, but with different values. So for button B, add to B, or add B, and then button C, we're going to add the value C. So now on my, my next button that I've selected to have the action go to the next page, I can now kind of add a, a gate to that button action. We'll ignore that. Hopefully it's not too slow. Just got a message that the network connection was too slow. Um, all right, so I've opened up what's called this condition right here, which is this, um, which is that gate that I talked about. So right here, I can decide the criteria that's actually going to allow that next button to do the action I set. And I'm going to call that variable here. So from this variable dropdown, I can select that variable one and I have several relationships that I can call. I can have the, I can make sure that the variable one contains a certain value, which is what I'm going to use in this case. I can add a relationship that says does not contain. So I only want the action to happen when, I only want the action to happen if a certain value is not in my bucket. 
um, these are numerical, equal to, greater than, greater than or equal to, and I can also add uh, the functionality to say only, <clears throat> only fire that action if this certain variable, this certain bucket is empty, or if it's not empty, if it actually has some sort of value in it. Like I said, in this case, I want to use the contains relationship. So I only want the next button to go to the next page if variable one, so if my bucket has the values A, B, and C. And that's all I need to do. So I'm going to insert a new page here and I'll add a page title <clears throat> so we can see when we actually advance to the next page. Then come up here and preview. So all my all my functionality should be set to to lock down this this slide. So all of those buttons have to be clicked to move on. So come up to view, preview. All right. So I have my next button. I can click that, and that does not advance because those uh, that variable condition has not been has not been satisfied yet. If I click here. That just added an A to my bucket. If I click next, it still won't let me advance because it doesn't have all of those values in there. I click this, it'll add a B. Click this, it will add a C. And now clicking next will advance to page two because I have met all of those, all of that variable criteria right here. <clears throat> and that's really all all it takes to use a condition, like I said, you can you can have some pretty crazy functionality and logic using those conditions. I think you can add up to 50 different conditions in in like Tora. We have a question. Yeah, a question has come up. When the variable says A B C, does it matter if the order is different? It does not. Nope. If you and that was that's where that those other <clears throat> relationships will come into play. So if I open this, I have the relationship set as contains, so it just has to contain A, B, and C. It can contain 50 A's, 20 B's, and one C, and it will still satisfy that condition. However, if I wanted it to only be A, B, C, and only in this order, I would have to select equal to, which means it's equal to that exact value. So what if you don't click them in order? It just doesn't matter? Yeah, it doesn't matter okay. if you if you have the relationship set to contains. Oh, as long as it's set to contains. As long as it's set to contains. Okay. Yep. Great. That's all the questions we've got here. Okay. Awesome. Another way you can you you can use variables is by what's called a variable reference. And at any time you can use a variable reference a variable reference excuse me to grab the uh, grab the value that's in that bucket that's in a certain variable and display it on the screen. <clears throat> and that can be really valuable for a lot of different reasons. Maybe you want to display a, maybe you have a variable, a bucket that gathered the learner's name, email, uh, and one that gathered their email address, and maybe you want to create a completion certificate at the end of your course that shows that. You'd use a variable reference there for a a results page, a either a custom quiz results page or one that Lector just creates automatically for you. Variable references will be used to show the uh, to show the final quiz score to the learner on the screen. And adding that is really easy. And another way I'll show you that is really really helpful is actually to use variable references to troubleshoot some of your interactions. So in order to add a variable reference going to insert a text block and in the title explorer I'll just call it reference and I want to add the the value of my of variable one I want that to be the reference in here so I can actually see, visually see what is what is in that bucket because there's no way to do that without actually adding it onto the screen so if I come up here to the properties of the text box in the add section, I have the option to add a variable in there. And because this is just a reference and I'm putting a variable in here isn't actually going to change the value, it's just going to show me the value, I do have access to all of those reserved variables that I mentioned before. <clears throat> so if I wanted to, to see the current date, I can add that in there and it'll populate with the current date. 
for our purposes, I want to see the value of variable one. And let's say, for example, so let's say I'm creating an interaction, and I have a bunch of I have a bunch of different buttons, and they all have different values. And let's say instead of adding the correct value C to this variable, I accidentally press V instead of C. So now, when I click this button C, it's going to add a V to that string, and then the criteria will not be satisfied for the next button, and it won't let me to go forward. It won't allow me to go forward. One other thing I have to add in order to actually see the variable value is that I have to add an action that actually changes this text box to update the value of that variable. Unfortunately, in Lectora, there's no way to just automatically set a variable reference to update whenever the variable changes. Um, that's that one of my very, very few uh, suggestions I would have to improve Lectora is add that functionality. A lot of the other authoring tools have that. However, in Lectora, you have to manually set this to update. In order to do that, I come up here to each of my buttons, add another action that on mouse click will change the contents of reference. So it's going to change the contents of this text box and set it to whatever is in my variable one bucket. So every time I click this button now, it will add A to that bucket and it will also show me what's currently in the bucket. And I'll copy that to each of those buttons. And let's see what this looks like. So because I don't have any initial value set in the variable manager, this is just showing null, which means there's it's a completely empty bucket there. Once I click this, it added the A. Click the second one, added the B. Click the third one, oh, I can see that added a V instead of a C, so now I know that I need to go back into button C and update that action to correctly refre reflect the criteria that will allow the learner to move on. That's just one small example. That's a way you can use variable references to, to troubleshoot an interaction and any interaction that you're using variables for. Uh, however, let's get into some more practical applications for, for all this stuff. So variable actions, um, variable references, and, and variable conditions as well. Any other questions while I open this? Um, there is a question about if you need multiple words, with, such as red, blue, and green, can you do that in one line or do you need three separate lines? It depends on what you're trying to to do with those words. So if you just want to add <clears throat> in, in the in the conditions, if you want the variable to contain those words in any um, actually no, you don't have to you don't have to add them in any separate line. That just goes back to what what I said about making sure that the relationship is contains rather than equal to because those those words are just a an assortment of letters, and it's just dropping all those letters into that bucket in the order that they're that they are. So, just want to make sure you're watching that that relationship part of the condition. Perfect. Thank you. All right, we have a few more minutes here, so I'm just going to jump into how you can use variables, references, and conditions to actually add some popular functionality to a course. So, in this particular course. I have a welcome slide, and on this welcome slide, I want to to gather some information from the uh, from the learner. I want to gather gather their name and also their job function, so I can call that uh, later in the course and then change the user experience depending on what is in that bucket. So in order to add to gather the name, I actually have to create that bucket. So step one. And when I, as I mentioned before, if I create an entry field like this, that is automatically going to create a bucket for me. Just do some small resizing, repositioning there. Come up to properties and change the name of my variable to name to make it easier to, to call in the future.
All right, there we go. And I also want to gather some um, information about job function. So if they, if the user comes in and there are certain, they're, uh, they have a certain job responsibility instead of having to create three separate courses with three, um, three whole different experiences, I can just use some variables here to actually shoot the learner to a different path depending on what they, what they give me here. And I'll do that by using a radio button group, kind of like I did before. And I'm going to quickly change some formatting here. <clears throat> just so it matches the rest of this slide. Not super important, I just did that really quickly. So there are three different options, <clears throat> three different values that can go into this job function bucket right here. Let me align these. All right, the first one is manager. So up here in the properties, I need to change the name. So this is actually the value that will go in the bucket when this radio one is clicked. And then I also want to change that label to actually show on screen. My second, my second option is maybe their team leader. Put that in there <clears throat> and then Third option is just a team member, not just a team member. All team members are important. Team member right there. So there are three different options, three specific values that can go into that radio group bucket, which I'm going to rename to job function. All right, so now I have the functionality in here to gather that information from from the learner that I can use later. But I also want to lock down this, this page because I want to make sure that I get that information before the user can advance because that information is going to be critical to the user experience coming up in the next slide. So I need this information, so I need to make sure that this next button does not allow them to advance unless they have provided that information to me. So what I'll do is I'll come, come here to my next button very similar to what we did last time. It's selected to go to next. I'll add a condition here. And there are two conditions that need to be satisfied. So there are two, two buckets that have to be filled in order for that gate to open and for the learner to move on in the course. The first one is name. And here, instead of the contains like I did last time, I'll just say is not empty. So as long as there's something in this name variable, in that name bucket, then that will satisfy this first condition. However, I also need this job function to be populated as well. So I'll do the same thing right here. Job function is not empty. And once you have more than one condition, you'll need to make sure you pay attention to this dropdown right here. <clears throat> By default, it will be set to all conditions must be true. So the name, in this case, the name bucket and the job function bucket have to have something in there in order to satisfy this condition and to open that gate. However, if I selected any condition, either of these can be true and that will open the gate. So if I didn't really care that they gave me their job function, maybe it just some information I wanted to know, but I absolutely had to have their name, that's where that would come into play. So I click okay there and then I also want to add a, a warning message so that if they click next without both of those buckets filled it will let them know that I need to to get more information from them so I will just copy this text box bring that down change that to please insert a name and select a job function there we go <clears throat> so that's a warning message I need to come up here to properties and set that to be initially hidden and I want that to show right here so I set my I've set my conditions so two things can now happen when they click this next button 
either they go to the next page or if those conditions have not been satisfied, then it shows them this, this message that lets them know that they need to, to fill out some more, some more things for me. So just show, and let me change this here so I can actually grab it. We'll call this warning so I know which one it is. Show warning. Make, I'll say I change that to any. I need that to be all. <clears throat> Clicked OK. Glad I checked that there. And let's preview this. So I have my, my name bucket and my job function bucket variables. They're both empty right now. If I click next, because those are both empty, it's going to give me this warning sign. If I, and then I can come in here, add my name, select the job function, and now that will let me move on. And now for this next page, I want to use some variable references to actually grab the information they gave me to personalize the personalize the experience for the learner. So right here, I want it to actually show the value of that name variable. So I can come up here in the properties, add that name variable right there. And I also want to show there the job function that they selected here at the end, just to add some personalization. The exact same process. I'll add the job function variable there. Go back and preview this. So now I'm Andrew, I'm a manager. It allows me to go and it shows. Hey Andrew, congratulations on beginning the journey to become a more effective manager. If I had selected team leader or team member, that value would change there. No, I don't need to create three different slides and do a bunch of, and <clears throat> add different actions and branching variables in order to have the right messaging show up. A question? Yeah, so a question has come up here. If I have a course that the user has to enter a code to get credit at the end, um, but they have to use either lowercase or uppercase letters, but they can't use a combo. If you use that combo, somehow it's breaking it. Is there a way that I can make it work if they use either upper or lowercase letters, do you know of? Is that a, a variable solution? That is, and that'll be in the in the conditional actions. So <clears throat> I'll just come up to here the next button where we where we had some of those. So that's where you would use not all conditions, but any condition. So let's say your your code that they had to enter was um I will say lectora lowercase, but if they entered lectora uppercase, it would also allow them to go through. So I would just change that to is equal to lectora lowercase and lectora uppercase, because this value is case sensitive right here. So that's where you would have to add it, any sort of scenario that could happen, that would be a separate line item in your conditions box. Excellent. Cool, that was a great question. All right, then, so now I have, I've changed the, uh, use some variable references to personalize the experience for the learner. And now, once they move past this slide, now I want to shoot them to a different, a different chapter, like tour chapter, depending on what they had provided me before. Again, using some conditional actions. So come to this next button right here. In this action, right now it's set to go to the next page. However, I want this to change depending on the job function that they provided to me. So I not only do I need some conditions and to call some variables, but I also need multiple actions here. So I'm going to change this to go to manager. On mouse click, add a condition if that job function is equal to manager. Again, for the, if I had this set as lowercase, that would not be satisfied because it is case sensitive and I have that radio button putting manager with a capital M <clears throat> into the bucket. So go instead of go to next page, I want to go to my manager chapter right here. So now it's saying, if I click this, 
and this is satisfied job function equal to manager I'm going to go to manager and then I would create three separate ones team leader and team member and now all I have to do is change the target team leader here if job function is equal to team leader it has to be exactly right and then same for team member and now the whole experience will change just depending on what is in <clears throat> that one bucket that was filled on that first slide so let's check this out all right I'll just abbreviate with a letter there and I'm going to select team member here go forward it said manager before now it says team member now if I click next shooting me to my role as a team member to see that again we'll come back in here choose a different value now I'm a team leader shows team leader there now same button now it's jumping to a slide that says team leader with some different messaging and a different image so you see you can add a lot of functionality a lot of branching pretty much I mean with variables it really is the only limit that you have is your is your imagination especially in Lectora of all the uh, of all the e-learning authoring tools out there Lectora is by far the best and the most um, most useful when it comes to variables. There's so much you can do. I just barely scratched the surface today. This was just kind of an, uh, an introduction to get the wheels turning on how you can possibly use variables in your course. Jump back into my, uh, my presentation here. I do have a here. quick comment here. Uh, somebody says, as a as word of advice, really, I always start my user variables with a one, for example, one and then variable name. And number them that way it saves a lot of time when you're trying to keep track of all of your variables yeah yeah that's a great idea using numbers will order them properly in that list as well you can also use um, underscores at the beginning of a variable if you want it to pop to the top definitely and that's a that's a great uh, a great comment whatever you decide to use in your development just find a naming convention that works that you can remember and then stick with it it'll save you a lot of time down the road and if you have uh, several developers, make sure everybody knows. Yes, that's, that's very important. Be on the same page. Uh, no other questions. Awesome. All right. All right, so thank you so much, Andrew. There are a couple uh, thoughts coming in here that are just saying that this was very useful. Thanks for uh, sharing this. Uh, we will be posting this. Uh, like I said, we'll, we'll send this out to everybody who is registered so you can reference this uh, on your own in the future. If you are regularly developing in Lectora and you're uh, needing assets, whether that's complete uh, you know, slides, full templates that are pre-built, or just assets like images or videos or uh, you know, sound effects, music, we've got those in the asset library. You can register for one of those today, uh, and in 10 days you can download uh, I'm sorry, in seven days you can download 10 assets and give those a shot, see if they'll work for you. So uh, you can do that by calling 801-796-2767 or if you just want to visit elearningbrothers.com right there on the main page, you'll see a section to sign up for free assets. Uh, so thanks everybody for joining us. Thanks Andrew Vass for this information and we'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.